and we're dealing with the topic, the gifts of the Spirit, and we're busy with part two. All right, if you want to um, go and do a bit of research around the gifts, you'll find them mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse, uh, sorry, chapter 12, verse 7 till 11. Okay, I'm not going to read through them right now, um, but I want us to deal with the, the three gifts this evening. All right, there are nine gifts, and they're divided into three major categories. The first category is utterance. That's the spoken gifts. The second category is the power gifts. The third category is the revelation gifts. All right, so the first utterance is where you say something. The power is where you do something. And the revelation is where something is revealed. Okay, so I want you to take note of the three categories. And tonight we're going to deal with the power gifts. And for most young people, this is the one that's the most exciting because this is where you go and do things. All right, anybody growing up likes to see action. All right, you want to see how God is going to move and what he's going to do. And so the first gift that we're going to deal with is the gift of faith. Now, the gift of faith is a special gift that allows you to trust God for a specific situation, all right, to the level that it becomes perfect faith. So in other words, God gives you a gift, and remember that we taught on this before, your level of faith is going to go up and down, all depends how much word you're going to have in your life. But when you come to the gift of faith, it takes your level and pushes it up to the 100% faith, which we call the measure. Okay, and it's going to push you right up. Now, the gift of faith operates particularly on one situation. So you don't have the gift of faith for everything in your life. You could have a gift of faith for a particular uh, situation that is needed. So most times, it's either a situation of maybe raising somebody from the dead. Or a situation where you're trusting God for a supernatural financial breakthrough. And you get faith that nobody can move you. No matter what anybody says, it is going to happen. And so even if you can't see it right now, it is definitely going to happen because you're operating in that faith. Now I want us to go and see in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. And this is where your level of faith pushes right up until the measure. It says this, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think of himself soberly, as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. Now, a measure means that we all get the same, all right? But we end up on the same level, but we don't operate on that level. Okay, We've got all the same potential, but we don't get there. But when you operate in the gift of faith, it takes your faith right up to the fullest potential and it happens. Everything happens if you're operating in that gift of faith. And so we want to see that Jesus, uh, Jesus practiced this many times. All right. This is a total dependency on God. Where would Jesus have practiced the gift of faith? When he walked on water. You see, it's not normal for somebody to walk on water. But Jesus Christ walked on water because he had a gift of faith operating. He trusted God. Now remember that Jesus Christ did everything that you and I have to do. What do I mean by that? He had to rely on the Holy Spirit. He had to rely on the gifts just like you and I. He had to operate and function just like you and I on this earth. So if Jesus Christ did something, it had to happen just like you and I. And so when Jesus Christ walked on the water, he had to operate and exercise in the gift of faith. Okay, so the gift of faith is really where you believe God without a shadow of a doubt. And you're operating in perfect faith. And that miracle takes place immediately because you are trusting God on that level. Okay, so that's the gift of faith. That is how the gift of faith operates. It's normally around a particular situation and God takes you up to that level and the miracle happens and then you'll go back to your level of faith, up and down, 
How does it go up? When more I get to know the word or hear the word for the day, my faith is up. In the few days that I don't, it starts going down again. And so it carries on. Okay, that's normal. That's why you'll have guys in church. They leave church on Sunday. They're ready to take on the world. By Wednesday, they need that injection from a small group or somewhere where they get the word again. And then by Sunday, they need it again because it's up and down. Okay, now let's get into the next one, the gifts of healing. How does that operate? What is that all about? It's a supernatural intervention of God's healing power over sickness and disease without any natural means. What does that mean? It means that you lay hands on somebody and in the name of Jesus, you command them to be healed and they 100% healed without any medication or any other means. All right, that is how a gift of healing operates. Now, Jesus practiced it many times. Okay, but I want to just read Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You see, Jesus Christ was operating under the unction of the Holy Spirit, just like you and I, and he also operated in these gifts. And so Jesus Christ had to operate in the gift of healing, just like you and I have to. Every believer should lay hands on the sick. All right, and we've been dealing a lot around that, around the communion and things. And so you really should understand that by now. But Mark chapter 16, verse 17 to 18, it says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons and they will speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, they shall by no means hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Okay, so I want you to see something. That every single believer should be operating on this level. Every believer should be laying hands on people and we should be seeing a, some sort of miracle taking place. All right, now well, we're not doing it because we haven't been um, exposed to this. We haven't been uh, encouraged to do this. So I want to tell you right now that we need to start practicing this. The reason we don't have the miracle is because we're not trying. You know, people can sit down and say, listen, um, Arthur, you've now prayed for two people who are dead and none is raised from the dead. Yeah, one day I'm going to get somebody raised from the dead. Why? Because I've tried. I've literally prayed for dead people. And so if you don't have a dead person, you're never going to have that miracle. So what am I saying? We have got to start getting into God's word. And God says that as a believer, you're supposed to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We are supposed to be praying constantly for sick people. Now, the problem is, is that firstly, we started to reduce it to the church only. Then we only reduced it to special meetings, you know, and so it carries on. So that it becomes so restricted that we hardly see miracles taking place anymore. We need to start stirring up those gifts again and saying, God, I thank you for a gift of faith. I want to believe you that nothing can waver me. I want to see uh, healings taking place like I've never seen before. Now, what is interesting about the gift of healing that I've noticed, this is just a personal observation, it's not a rule. But what I've seen is, is that even the guys who are healing evangelists, you know, the guys who really operate in this gift and really have an incredible uh, flow in it, you'll always see that there's one particular thing that they are stronger in than the others. What do I mean by that? You'll see that they'll be able to lay hands on somebody. The one guy will have a tremendous result in deaf ears. Then the next guy will come and everybody who is lame will suddenly walk and you, can, you just see crutches everywhere he's around. And it's just amazing, and I've observed this many times, how that these healing evangelists have one particular area that they are super, um, they're excelling. And... I, I don't have an answer for that. I know that they really trust God for all sorts of healings and they pray for everything. But what is really exciting for me is 
when I've sat down in some of these meetings and see how God has actually healed people by mass. You know, I've been in the Reynold Bonker meetings where the people have literally, um, by mass healing, just start coming. You know, I remember being in some of these campaigns and just being part of what's going on. And I have seen people climb out of wheelchairs even before the meeting started. And I happen to know that the person who climbed the one case particularly, um, you sit down and, and you know that this person is, is crippled because I was one of the guys who had to come and help carry the wheelchair into the stadium. And so it wasn't like, I, I don't know the person personally, but I mean, you could physically see that their legs were lame. You know, they were totally paralyzed. And I remember sitting in the stadium and the next second, this person just started to get all excited and started to, to stretch their legs and started to get out of the wheelchair. Then they started to push the wheelchair around the stadium. I want to tell you, God really starts moving and your faith starts building when you start seeing the gift of healing in operation. And where did that come from? They weren't even praying for people. There was an expectation. People were expecting. The atmosphere was one of God. We want to see miracles. I want to encourage us today. We need to start having an expectation for the gifts. We need to start expecting God to get people saved. We need to start expecting God for supernatural, divine things happening. You know, I, I really... I praise God for some of the experiences that I was able to see and experience in my life. Because what it's done is it's shown me that there is a real. Just because we're not seeing it today does not mean that it doesn't exist. Not to the levels that I grew up with. And I'm saying we can get right back there. All we have to do is create an expectation and start trusting God and stirring up the gifts inside of us. You know, just because we might not see it in our church today doesn't mean that I can't see it in my home. It doesn't mean that I can't see it in my workplace. I can see how that men and women can get a gift of faith and start trusting God to turn this whole economy around for their business. You see, the gift of faith isn't just for healings. The gift of faith is for any situation where you trust God and you know God is going to come through for you. So I want to encourage us. Let's get hungry for God. Let's get hungry for the gifts. Let's get hungry for the move of the Spirit. You know, I have seen mass deliverances. I have seen where people have just given their hearts to the Lord. Where people have just surrendered stuff. I mean, you just cannot fake this stuff. Let me give you an example. Where people start trusting God. God starts moving. OK, and that is that is a simple rule. And that's a principle that we need to start going back to, folks, because if we're going to trust God for the gifts, we need to understand that there is a move of God that is available to every single person. I remember I was really privileged to be part of the, the praise and worship team at the time of one of these crusades. And what happened was uh uh, evangelist Rainer Bonker stood in the front and he, and he made a simple thing. And he said, listen, if you are bound by something, I want you to get rid of it right now. I want to tell you something. I was totally shocked to see what happened next. Everything started to fly towards the platform. Okay. Everything. We are talking about knives. We are talking about drugs. We are talking about all sorts of weapons. Everything was suddenly just thrown at the platform. Now, that is not something that just normally happens. That happened simply because the expectation was, God, we want to see a miracle. And let me tell you something. We saw people getting set free by the masses. We literally saw how demons were coming out of people all over the place. I just praise God that I was in a, in a situation where I could actually observe what was going on. And so what I want to say to you is we need to get hungry again. Say, God, I want that miracle power operating in my life. It's not left for somebody. Okay. It is genuinely 
available to every believer. If you are hungry, you can operate in every one of these gifts in Jesus' name. And so I want you to see that you can say, God, I want to see miracles happen in my life on a daily basis. I want to be part of this. I want to see God changing in our society, changing things, bringing restoration, bringing all sorts of miracles that are going to take place. Number three is the working of miracles. Now, this is a creative miracle. This is where something happens that, um, that is not a healing. What is a healing? I'm busy restoring or stopping some sort of sickness. I'm busy restoring it. Okay? Let me give you an example. It's when a limb grows. Somebody's limb is cut off and they don't have an arm. Suddenly, they suddenly get an arm and the arm grows out. You know? I've seen a few cases where this has happened. I'm not with the limbs. I haven't been involved with that. But what I have seen is I saw somebody who had no eyes, literally no eyes. And while they were under the power of God, their eyes, eyeballs started to come into their sockets and they could see. Now that was a creative miracle. And there was no doubt that that happened. Okay, because you could sit down and go, well, this person had no eyes and now you can see. And it was done on video so people could actually see it. I have seen some video footage of people like A.A. Allen that would pray for people. And physically you'd see like a, a rash and stuff that was on the people. They would just physically just disappear in front of everybody. And so this is where, the, where a limb grows or something happens that, that is very, uh, very different. Do you remember the ten lepers? They came to Jesus Christ and they wanted to be healed. And Jesus Christ said, you are healed. They went off to go show themselves to the priest. And one leper came back. And listen to what Jesus Christ said to this leper. And he said to him, he had asked first of all, where are the others? So they said, well, I don't know. I'm just coming back to give glory and thank you. And I wanted to say thank you for praying for me and healing me. And he said to him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. There is a difference between healing and being made whole. Let me give you an example. When a person has leprosy, it starts eating away limbs. There are scars. There are all sorts of things that have gone from leprosy. And these guys obviously had to be seen as lepers, otherwise they wouldn't be recognized so quick as a leper. And so what happened in this case was that this guy got healed. So in other words, the leprosy disappeared. And he came back to Jesus and Jesus said, listen, where's the others? And they, they, he said, I don't know. So then he said to him, listen, your faith has made you whole. You are whole. In other words, there's not even a sign of leprosy. There's not a mark. There's not a scarring. If there was a, a limb missing, he got his limb back. Whatever the leprosy had tried to steal from him was recreated. That is miracles. Okay. Something that wasn't there suddenly it comes there. And it's not just for healing. All right? Let me give you another example of a miracle. Is where the food was multiplied. That was a gift of, uh, that was a gift of miracles. All right? In Mark chapter 8, verse 19 to 20, it says this, When I, uh, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to them, Twelve. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did we take up? And they said seven. So you must see that Jesus Christ did this more than once. Okay, he fed the multitudes more than once. And he kept on saying to them, okay, how many times, how, how many baskets did you guys get from this? Now, why did Jesus keep doing this? Because he was busy demonstrating these miracles that could happen. Jesus turned water into wine. That is a miracle. All right. This is the gift of miracles that are operating. This is how you do that. Now, I had a really exciting um, uh, uh, experience or, or testimony from one of the YWAM group. All right. Now, the YWAM group were um, evangelists that were going around with all the ships. 
you know, the Dulas, the Logos, all of these guys, that's part of the YWAM group. And so what happened was they, they gave a very interesting testimony. They, stuck, they got stuck somewhere, and I don't exactly remember the whole story. But what happened was they sat down and they were lacking food. All right, they lacked food. Now, it wasn't like they were going to go hungry forever. They just didn't have food for that night and the next day or whenever it was. They were going to get supplies, but the supplies had delayed to getting to them. So they really had a lack of food just for that one meal or that evening, okay? And then they were going to, obviously, next day, they were going to get right. So what they did was they counted the eggs that they had left, and they were just going to boil some eggs because that's all that they had for that time. And they counted it, and I think that, let's, I can't remember the figures, let's say there were 20 people, and they had 10 eggs. So what they decided to do was, let's boil these, and then we'll split it up evenly afterwards. So they counted it, put it in the pot, you know, left it to boil, gave it so many minutes, whatever it was. And when they came to take the eggs out, they had more eggs than people. Now everybody that was there testified to this thing because they had, had this whole discussion on how they're going to feed everybody and what where they were sitting. So that is a working of miracles. All right, a miracle took place there where the food literally multiplied. I have many testimonies where people were sitting in soup kitchens and they were busy feeding. And suddenly they ended up with more and more and more people and they have no idea physically to the amount of food that was made, how they actually fed the numbers that went through those doors. Now, God does these things, but we need to start expecting God to do these things. We need to start saying, God, we're trusting you for supernatural miracles to take place. We are trusting you for multiplications, supernatural things to take place. Now, even in today's society, we can trust God for supernatural things. You can trust God for divine contacts, uh, divine contracts for your business, for instance. That can be an absolute miracle. They could say to you, listen, you don't qualify for this thing, and God still gets it to you. That is a gift of miracles happening in your life. The working of miracles. Where stuff cannot happen, can happen because of this gift. Okay, so I want you to see that it's more than just a um, uh, just a creative thing of physical healings, okay? Where an eye comes or a hand comes or an arm comes. Okay, so now, I want you to understand something. People have said to me, listen, um, the Bible says in, the, in, the, in these gifts that, um, you know, you should, uh, God gives as he wills. Well, God gives as he wills according to the circumstance that you're in. Because very often, there are more than one gift, there is more than one gift in operation to be able to do the miracle or the thing that needs to happen. Let me give you an example. All right. Um, sometimes there's two or three that are in operation. To raise somebody from the dead. Okay. If I want to raise somebody from the dead, which gifts, and I like doing this in our Bible college environment, I would ask him, which gifts do I need to operate in if I'm going to raise somebody from the dead? You know, I definitely do not need a gift of prophecy. You know, thus saith the Lord, you are dead. I don't need that at that time. Okay, I need other gifts to operate. Number one, I need to have a gift of faith. I need to know that God is going to raise this person from the dead. Smith Wigglesworth has an incredible testimony. He walked into a room one day and the person had died. And so what he did was he took the person, dead body, and pinned them against the wall and said, live in Jesus' name. Let the person go. And they fell to the floor because they're dead. Everybody started to going, oh, he come down. Here comes trouble. It was the attitude. Can you imagine if your minister rocked up in your house and grabbed the corpse and pinned it against the wall, and it could be one of your, your loved one, and said, in the name of Jesus, be healed or live and let go and they fall on the floor, how you would react. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he did it again. Pinned the guy against the wall, said, life, live, let go. The guy hit the dick. Third time. And as he did it, the person came back to life. 
Now, he had a gift of faith operating there. He did not stir. He did not believe what anybody said or anybody's reaction. He knew like he knew that God was going to raise this person from the dead. So the first thing, you need the gift of faith. Believe in God that no matter what anybody says, does or think, is not going to deter you, change you, make you doubt, because you know that this person is going to be raised. All right? The second one gift that you need is the working of miracles. This is the creative miracle where life has to come back into the body. So you have the gift of faith. Now you need a creative miracle to operate. And then thirdly, you need the gifts of healing to operate because the thing that killed the person in the first place has to be restored and fixed. In other words, if their heart is backed up, you can't raise him from the dead and their heart backs up again. So you need all three gifts to operate in this particular scenario. So this is what you need to do as a believer. You need to say, God, I desire all nine gifts. I thank you, Lord, that as they need it, they are going to operate. Sometimes in multiples, sometimes one at a time, sometimes the combination that needs to be there. God, you are in control. And so that is what we are after. So I'm going to pray with us right now in the name of Jesus, and we are going to stir this up in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you right now that you are moving by your spirit in our lives, and Lord, that you are stirring us up to start hungering after the gifts of the spirit again in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you right now that each and every person at the sound of my voice will start getting hungry for the gifts of the spirit, and Lord, that we are going to start seeking for supernatural miracles to take place all around us. Lord, I thank you that men and women are going to stand up in the gift of faith and they're going to trust you like never before. That they're going to stand up with the gifts of healing and start laying hands on the sick like never before. Lord, I thank you that men are going to get to the, and women are going to get to the level where we can go into hospital wards and literally empty them because of the power of God. Lord, I thank you right now that we are going to see men and women stand up. Lord, with the gift of miracles, where things look impossible, but there is a miracle that takes place to turn it around. Lord, I thank you that every single one of us are not only going to desire, but we're going to start flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.